So a bit more detail on the actual Roman fortress uh, itself. Um, the phase one development covers this area here, which is primarily the barrack blocks and the two large rectangular stores buildings extending over the western defences. Just outside phase one, but within the phase, the, the, the overall phase, north gate development area, just to draw your attention to the elliptical building, um, which was partially excavated in advance of the um, original forum development in the 60s, but sadly all lost now, as indeed was the Roman Baths complex. Just put these two slides in here to illustrate the development of the area um, over time. And what I've just draw your attention to is the fact that the Northgate development area remained largely as open ground in the post-Roman period. So just again, we're back here. You can see the large areas of open fields here. And that really continues into the 18th and the 19th century, basically. So the area hadn't been extensively built over until fairly recently, which had implications for the preservation of the material. And just finally, just, uh, well, another slide. As we looked at this um, development, which is, as we'll see in a minute, has uh, developed over many years, um, it has been phased into areas um, of particular preservation. So this work really um, goes back to David Mason's work back in the 80s, 70s and the 80s, in which he tried to zone the areas of preservation. So there were areas that we knew had been completely voided by development in green in here. Other areas in yellow where um, deposits were thought to survive in a not particularly good state or, or had been lost, although as it proved that Will, will show that wasn't actually the case. And then the areas in red and blue are the areas of particularly high uh, quality preservation. And those are the areas that we sought in this project to um, preserve in situ. And that's what we're concentrating on in the, in the second part of this presentation. And then here, just again to give some context, this shows the Phase one of the Northgate development before the development started. The former bus station, Pocket Park, and just for a reference point, here's the Crown Plaza Hotel where we are today, really. And then my, my final slide is just really a project timeline which shows the development of the Northgate project um, since the, 90, the, the mid 90s when it was first proposed to, to develop the site. And really, it's been through a number of iterations, basically, um, which have changed over time. Um, there was a project in 2008, which was derailed by the financial crisis. 2015, uh, the project underwent major changes because of um, changing retail habits and things. Um, but also, I think the archaeological response changed over time. Initially, the proposal was really to pick it all up, basically, but I think it was recognised, given the national significance of the remains, um, that that was no longer appropriate, and ideas, approaches to develop, to preserving the material in situ um, have been developed through those, pro those various iterations, um, as we'll see. In terms of why we've, te we've approached in this way with preservation in situ. Um, I think one just could take refuge in local and national planning guidance because obviously, as we'll see, the remains are of national significance and deserve preservation in situ. But I think in the case of Chester, there are specific reasons why this approach is um, justified and desirable. I mean, I suppose as in many towns, it's a diminishing resource, the archaeology, important to stress or to remind people just how much archaeology we've lost in Chester um, over the last 50 years. I mentioned the elliptical buildings, building and the baths complex, um, which is 
despite the heroic efforts of people on the ground at the time, um, were really excavated without an adequate archaeological response, something which I think still has the power to shock even after 50 years. And um, again, um, despite the efforts of people on the ground, we have large amounts of material that isn't published still. So it does seem to me very difficult to justify digging up yet more archaeology in Chester when we have so much material um, that remains unpublished. Basically. That's not to say there isn't a case for um, targeted research work. And we've seen the, um, the results of the amphitheatre as an example of that fairly recently. Um, I think that's really all I want to say in terms of the general introduction. And I think it's now just time to uh, hand over to Rachel Newman to explain about um, the whole approach to the an interesting challenge to say the least. Uh, and one of the things that's helped, I think, uh, maybe we should say that of course as I'm sure you're aware, uh, this is a site that's one of the only five designated as an area of archaeological importance and therefore the presumption must be that uh, there is uh, protection of the archaeology. Uh, I, for my sins, was brought in as the, the actual lead consultant, although I depended a lot on my who were very much more dedicated Romanists than perhaps I am. Um, but the police was very much to work with the design team to try, in the first instance, to develop something that would actually meet the criteria of the two percent of the detection, uh, only two percent loss, as you like, of the archaeological resource. Now, I'm sure in many ways uh, it's helped by the fact that this is a Roman source. So we can actually predict, to a certain extent, uh, what might be underneath. And also, very much as Mark has said, by the fact that this area was open land until relatively recently. So therefore, that both meant that there was a presumption that the strategy would be well preserved, but also that the area above was not of huge archaeological significance. And that's where, in effect, we started. First of all, with a series of evaluations, because it was quite clear that if we were going to develop the site um, in a way that was protective of the archaeology, we needed to know exactly where the archaeology was. Now, as Mark has said, there have been various um, iterations of this project over the last best part of 30 years, <coughs> which had undertaken some evaluation. So we turned to the evaluation of areas that hadn't been looked at with a very clear aim which was to try and develop a sequence where we knew where, if you like, the most significant archaeology began in terms of height above sea level. As I think you might be able to see, the archaeology, which is at the bottom of the left-hand slide, is uh, covered by an area of dark soils, unsurprisingly in the town, or city in this case, and then um, modern layers above. And from this, and from the areas which quite clearly had been destroyed by development, by sewers and infrastructure, we developed an archaeological plane, as it was called. I'm sorry, this is a bit sort of um, unclear, and without a pointer, and being short, I can't actually read it. But you can see that there is a line above which there is a lot going on, and a line below which that there isn't much going on. And that was the archaeological plane. And I must admit, that I thought at one point that the task was going to be extremely difficult because trying to persuade uh, certain elements of the design team that they couldn't uh, just say it's impossible to get less than 30 percent destruction was not an option. And for that, I'm very grateful to the fact that the developers were actually Chester West and Chester Council who understood the importance of the archaeology. And I'm particularly grateful to do this broadly planning advisor on that project, and also to Gordon Blair, who was in effect a fixer, who literally could go 
in and go, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to lift all those services. You're going to put those above the archaeology of the plane. And I'm very pleased to say that despite the fact that it looks like spaghetti, by the time we finished the design, and I should say that this design was very unusual, uh, as I understand it, that we also included all the services, not just the design of the, the building in this, we managed to get the predicted uh, destruction down to 3.91%, which was deemed as acceptable. As part of the planning application, we also wrote quite clear uh, and quite detailed written speech in observation um, in terms of what the action would be to each element. And those elements could be defined as within the red and blue areas, preservation in situ. Uh, with a, a minimum of strip mapping report and potentially targeted uh, excavation of what you do, down to uh, just what you do from the areas where you thought that all the archaeology would be uh, destroyed. As Mark has said, there was one major surprise here in that the area of the bus station, which Mark has, has indicated, which is behind us, literally to the left, um, was thought to have been excavated in a tomb. By uh, earlier excavations in the transit of the development of the bus station. Uh, this proved not to be the case. Indeed, it only comes back to the lack of genuine publication of the area that uh, it was quite unclear. Uh, actually, what we found was the developments had been excavated to formation level, and the early Roman fortress was sitting quite intact and completed. So, actually, However, we knew it from the evaluation early enough that we actually uh, were able to design out the, um, the elements and also, quite crucially, to persuade the developers, the principal contractor, that they shouldn't take the subbase away just because they did really take the subbase away, but it should only be removed in the areas where the development had to go beneath it. So the archaeology is largely right sealed by the subbase of the we then follow through the construction, uh, and again, I would say this one is my results of archaeology, but I think the correct decision was also to quote a colleague of mine, Paul Dunn, as the project manager for the principal contractor to undertake the field work so we could actually work in pencil to make sure that things were to uh, according to plan, as it were. We developed a tracker which looked at to find exactly what was going to be destroyed or predicted to be destroyed by each element of the, of the uh, development, and then to actually measure how much had been developed and had been destroyed. And I'm very pleased to say that the 3.91% uh, predicted destruction, we got down to 2.24% uh, destruction in the end. Uh, most of that was undertaken in one particular area, which was a service station on uh, the northern side of the site, just on the other side of the car park, which might be located outside, and also in the uh, area of the uh, of one car park of the Southern Island Market. However, because it's a very thought, there was quite a lot that could be improved uh, even from small scale interventions. So, for instance, as you can see here, from that, a very narrow trench inside, you can see the archaeology that come up. We actually found opposite and opposite kind of floors, uh, plastic walls, and were quite clearly in the centurion's quarters of the northernmost barrack, which had never been looked at in the past. This is because all the dead archaeological and evacuation is quite an unusual place. The other main area where the excavation took place was what's known as Palma. Which was in the area that had been excavated before. And that's very much where we were able to expose early Roman archaeology and the role of the open area archaeology that was. One of the best things we found was we carefully designed.
it was quite a lot of archaeology went in amongst it, but it was very much uh, kept under control. So you might say, well, that was a bit of a waste of time, then, wasn't it? You actually, um, you know, what did you manage to find 